Aya. Aya. You may be seated. I know you guys are uh, now tired. But I am not going to make a speech. I just want first to thank those who have spared their time to come here and share their views about Jaramogi with us today. I want to thank our friend Dr. Lara Otunu, who has come all the way from Uganda to be with us here. And, and the, those who are joined us virtually from outside the, the country, we thank them. And those who have been here in the panel here, we thank them. Also those who have given keynote speeches here. Now from what they have all said, you can say that uh, it is like the, well, the seven people who went to find out, those blind people who went to find out how what an elephant lo looks like. From what they all said, actually a picture has emerged of Jiramogi Oginga Odinga. As a family, we thank everybody for sparing their time to come and be here today. This event would have been held uh, three years ago, but because of the COVID, we decided to postpone it. And today it was so important because this is the 30th anniversary of Jaramogi, where we decided that it must be held here today. Uh, Jamogi was very many things, a very versatile character, very engaging when you want to talk to him, but very simple. It was very, very simple. We remember when we were growing up here in this town, Jamogi just used to wear kinyasa and a color shoes. That was his standard dress in town. That's how he was known. And uh, that is how he even went up to Lejiko. You will see, if you read the Notice of Huru, there is a place where they are now discussing the dress, Yamogi's dress in, in Bungi, how he should get into Bungi. Eventually he won that and was able to be going to Bungi with, uh, without having to put up a, a, a tie. So, but growing up as, as children, you know, uh, he had been a teacher. And therefore, he was very, very strict with his, uh, us as children. He wanted us to grow up like any other native children around. And uh, we had it very rough, me and the Buru here as children. But now, in retrospect, we are grateful to him that by treating us like ordinary people, we grew up as true Kenyans and we therefore understood the problems the ordinary peasant children were experiencing in the rural areas. We were removed from schools here in Kisumu and taken back to a rural school down there. We lost two years of our education because of transfer from Kisumu to the rural home there. Because when we went there, they said we were too small to go to standard three. So we had to go and start again in standard one. But that was okay for us. We, we think that it was a, a good experience. It prepared us for life in the future. But Jeremogi, this, this other aspect of Jeremogi which has not been properly appreciated. Jeremogi the teacher. Jeremogi really wanted people to get education. And he spent a lot of his time and a lot of his money trying to promote education among the uh, uh, Kenyans. At the time he, was, he died, there were 54 ch children in different stages of education. Some were in nursery, primary, secondary and university. 
whom he was sponsoring. We decided as a family to ensure that all those children would get education in accordance with their abilities. And through the foundation, we raised money and we ensured that all the 54 children Jeremogi was sponsoring got education. It was a time when there was nothing like CDF. So, but we managed to ensure that these ch children got education. Some we sent abroad to universities. No one of Jeremogi. But he had started this thing much earlier. When he resigned from teaching in Maseno and came and set up a business here, he was helping very many students who wanted to go abroad. And when he now became the chairman of the Care of Law Union, he now actually institutionalized it. Very many students who went abroad in those days got support from Law Union. And uh, when he went on a trip, he had been invited to go to India. What happened is, Jaramogi had constructed a building in the center of the town here. It's, he called it uh, Ramogi House. And that building was completed in 1951. So in 1952, he, when he invited the governor. He wrote a letter to the governor through the PC to come and officially launch or open the, open the, the building. The reply came back that uh, the town center is not for Africans, natives. That Africans should go and build in the uh, native uh, reserves. The town center is only for Europeans and Asians. So that is not in rule, you can read it there. So after that rejection, he now wrote to the Indian High Commission. By that time, India had attained independence and had posted a High Commissioner here in Nairobi, who was representing the whole of Eastern Africa. It was called Sha'apa Sahib Pant. So Apa Sahib Pant accepted the invitation to come. So he came here to Kisumu to open the building. And when he looked at the building, he was so impressed that he said that people who are still struggling under colonial oppression can put up a building like this. He invited Jaramogi to go to India to see how Indians are working to reconstruct their country after independence. That is how Jaramogi traveled to India. And uh, in India, he spent two months in India. He traveled the length and the breadth of India, met so many people, the Minister of Education, the Minister for Culture, the Minister for Industries. He toured from uh, Bombay to Delhi, to Bangalore, to Chennai, to Calcutta, to um, Srinagar, all part of India. Some by tra tra train, by road, by air. And when he came back, he wrote a book in Luo. It's called, it was called Dueche Areo e India. Two months in India. He recorded everything that he had seen in India. Uh, that book was later on translated by an, an Indian friend of him, Ambu Bhai Patel, into English. And the copies are available there. You can buy them. Two months in India are available there. Uh, noted, noted Huru is also available there. Uh, Flames of Freedom is also available there. Anybody who wants can buy. In that book, he was so impressed. He, he met with uh, the then Indian Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. And there were long discussions. And he signed an agreement there 
with the Indian government that he, I mean, he, he, he could send Kenyan students to go and study in India. So long as they get transport to go to India, they would get Indian government scholarship to study for free in Indian universities. So Jaramogi then came here and recruited Kenyans to go and study in India. He opened an office in that building called Jivan Bharat building where the Indian High Commission was and put a Kenyan who had come from India at that time called Olwandi Kudul as the secretary. To that scholarship program, many Kenyans went to study in India. From 1953, four, five, six, all that, people like from here I can give you some names. Udungo Mamu, Umolo Kero, Tomokelo Dungu, Udero Joey, Akoko Mboya, Mauro Mauro Keo. And out there, Joe Karanja, who became the, the first high commissioner in London, vice uh, uh, chancellor of University of Nairobi, and vice president. Henry Waridi, the first member of parliament for uh, Mukruini. Kalem Bendile was an MP for uh, 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 somewhere in Okambani. Omoto eh? Omoto Masahalia was uh, Masahalia we used to live together with him here he was working at Luther uh, near here uh, company uh, SMU Tieno all those were students who Jiramogi sent to study in India this is long before airlift so the Indian uh, 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 package was much earlier than the airlift. And the airlift only had about 300 people. But then after that, when Jaramogi traveled to the Eastern European countries, first Jaramogi had gone on a court to, to, to attend a conference in, 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 in Tokyo, Japan a World Peace Conference. When he was at that conference in Tokyo, he met the Chinese delegation. The Chinese delegation invited him to go and visit China. And he accepted. That is how the Mogi went to the East. When he went to China, they went first to Shanghai. From Shanghai, they went to Peking, those days, now Beijing. And he met with Mao Zedong and Xu and Lai. And they had discussions and they arranged for him to go to other parts of China to go and see how China were working to develop their country, Chinese. He went to several provinces of China. From there, they arranged for him to go to Moscow. But that time, the Chinese and the Russians had not disagreed. So they're the ones who made arrangement for him to go and meet with Nikita Khrushchev, then the president of the Soviet Union in Moscow. So he went from Peking to Moscow and had discussions with the leadership of the Soviet Union. First, in Beijing, they agreed to support the liberation movement in Kenya. In Moscow also they agreed to support the liberation movement in Kenya. From Moscow he flew to London. At Heathrow Airport, it's when the immigration saw the stamp of Peking. They did not mind about Moscow, but Peking, the red China. So he went to China, yes. You know, that was, he was holding a British passport. At that time, everybody was a British subject. And the British subject, uh, uh, citizens were not supposed to go to Red China. But the guy 
uh, just did not say anything, but noted and I think reported to the immigration. He went into the town. But from there, when he came back, when he came back to Nairobi and landed at, at uh, Jomukinyata Airport now, then uh, in Bakasi Airport, the passport was impounded. They took away the passport. They did not give any reasons. So there was a headline, Jamogi's passport impounded. So the matter was raised in the Legico. And there was a long debate over it. The, the majority of members of parliament at that time were white. And they were saying how Jamogi was playing about with fire. One was called Group Captain Briggs. Uh, one was Sir Michael Blandell. Uh, one was called Enes Basi. And all of them were condemning Jaramogi and saying that Jaramogi was playing with what he did not understand. He who rode on the back of the tiger ended inside the stomach of the tiger. So one said, Mr. Dinga should know that men much more intelligent than him have tried and have failed, and will fail. So when Jeremogi rose to respond, he told the gentlemen who were talking that, look, even me, before I went to China, I was as ignorant as you people about China. But what I, I saw in China was an eye-opener to me. China is the country with the biggest population in the world. At that time, 540 million people. But in China, I did not see any people walking naked. Everyone was clothed. In China, I did not see people who are unemployed. Everybody was employed. In China, I did not see people hungry. Everybody was eating. China was able to feed 540 million people. We have no beggars in China. So if that is what's communism, then communism is food. It's like food. That's what Jeremogi said. You can see it in the Hansard. Tomorrow, headline in East African Standards, Communism, my food, says Odinga. How <laughs> the and the tag of being a communist. Jeremogi never studied Marxism, Leninism at all. He did not. But Jeremogi was just being realistic at that time. Now, what indeed he negotiated scholarships with those countries for Kenyans. At that time, it was not easy to get a passport if you are going to study in those countries. So the Kenyans who had moved out and had been denied opportunity to go and study in Rome, and they had gone by foot through Uganda and through South Sudan to Khartoum, negotiated and opened an office in Khartoum, and then went also up to Cairo and opened an office. Yamogi met them, and through, the, through that connection, he opened an office in Cairo, and was able to meet the Egyptian president, Mr. Nasser. But I wanted to tell you that when his passport was impounded here, he got a passport, a national passport from Kwame Nkrumah, president of Ghana, another one from Gamal Abdel Nasser, president of Egypt. She had two international passports. So he went there, and in, in Cairo, they set up an office led, uh, uh, operated by the late William Odiembo Kelo, Werambitho, and uh, Abdallah Karungo. And then they opened up another office in London, operated by Otiego Thiel. 
in London, Nukrumah bought a building called Africa Unity House, which building he dedicated to the liberation struggle on Africa. And all Africans who had a problem in London could go and stay in that building. And he asked Jaramogi to give him somebody to manage that building. Jaramogi gave him a Kenyan who had been a student in London and had not come back called Othigo Theano. Became the, the, the manager of Africa Unity House. So now the Cairo office was the one that was liaising with all these countries Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Romania, the Soviet Union, uh, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, and China, and so on, about scholarships. So Kenyans only really needed to get to Cairo. From Cairo, you now be able to travel to get a scholarship to study for free in all those countries. Through that program, there were 5,000 Kenyans managed to study in the university. That was Jeremogi's initiative, which has never been recognized or appreciated because people highlight only the 300 or so people who were, were taken by uh, air, air, airlift and from Mbagazi to, 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 to New York. But there's nothing, it's a drop in the water of the ocean by comparison to many Kenyans who studied through Jeremogi's initiative, first in India, then in, in, in those other countries, then in the UK, in the United States. People like Hira Lingueno, who studied in Harvard, he was sponsored by Jaramogi. Washington Jalango Kumu was sponsored by Jaramogi to go and study in Harvard. Jaramogi sent very many students to the United States also, and also to other West African countries, Ghana, Egypt, and so on and so forth. This is an aspect of Jeremogi's contribution that has never been appreciated. And I wanted this to also go on record. Jeremogi as an educator. So I therefore, I really want to thank you all for coming to help us remember Jeremogi. Asante Nisana, Mungo Bariki.